realizing that his northern flank is actually completely unprotected, Kincaid orders Oldenborg to move on to ambush the southern force before they make it through the Surigao Strait. Oldenborg's warships are all but stacked between the Japanese southern force and the Allied landing. Meanwhile, the commander of the Japanese southern force is under no illusions that he and his men are likely heading to their deaths. Earlier on the 24th, a Japanese float plane reported American warships massing around the Surigao Strait. In order to transit the narrow opening, Rear Admiral Nishimura's warships will have to form on a single fire line, meaning all of those battleships have already crossed the T, which places the Japanese at a massive disadvantage. Nishimura had expected to be reinforced by Vice Admiral Shima's 5th Fleet, consisting of two heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, and four destroyers, but Shima has been lagging behind southern ports. Nishimura has decided not to wait for these reinforcements, and Shima won't be able to provide adequate support in the coming battle. Southern force presses on anyway. Nishimura's only son was killed two years earlier, and many of Southern Force's officers believe their leader sees this operation as a chance to join him in death. As it stands, Oldendorf's warships are ready to grant this work. At just before 11pm, 39 patrol boats under the command of Lieutenant Commander Robert Leeson launched an attack on the far larger end of the vessel. Leeson's fleet of small but fast PT boats have a twofold mission. They are to harass and distract the Japanese, while also reporting their position so Oldendorf can adjust his formation accordingly. Splitting into three ships, the PT boats slash through the waters of the Surigao Strait, while the Japanese warships fire star shells and sweep the ocean with their searchlights in order to bring their guns to bear on the Americans. A PT boat captain records what he is seeing. Water. I've got one big one in sight. My god, there are two more big ones, and maybe another. Nishimura's warships open fire with their main and secondary batteries, but the PT boats are frustratingly hard to hit. Columns of water erupted, taking on water at an alarming rate. At 3.18am, her commanding officer decides to break off the engagement and retreat to the south to allow Kuso's crew to perform damage control. Two minutes later, the second spread of 18 torpedoes find their targets. The destroyer Yamagumo takes two hits and is vaporized by a magazine explosion, sinking within minutes. Of her crew of 200, only two survive. Destroyer Michishio takes two torpedoes and retreats her in water. Asagumo has her bow blown off, but her crew is able to hold the flooding, allowing the wounded destroyer to retire to the south. One of Monson's torpedoes strikes battleship Yamashiro on her port side with a half turret magazine. A crew floods the magazine to prevent an explosion. But Yamashiro's speed is cut in half like her sister ship Fuso. However, a far worse fate is about to befall Fuso. As the damaged battleship retreats to the south, she is being shadowed by two Sir, PT Barbara boats, Perez, which are reporting her position. At 3.38am, the waters of the Surigao Strait are suddenly brightened by a tremendous explosion. Lookouts aboard the American battleship 25 nautical miles to the north are amazed by the ball of fire which rises into the night sky. It is not known what caused the final explosion, but the battleship Fuso sinks in just 12 minutes. I have to reinforcements. Of the 1,630 sailors aboard, only 10 survived the oil fire. Unaware of the disaster, Admiral Nishimura attempts to radio Fuso at 3.52 AM, but receives no response. Nonetheless, he continues to charge forward through the narrow waters of the strait. Nishimura is also hopeful that Admiral Shima's 5th Fleet will catch up and help Southern Force break through to the base of Rome. The wounded Japanese formation staggers forward, but this time they are headed straight into the massed guns of six US Navy battleships, four heavy cruisers, and four light cruisers. Aboard the USS West Virginia, the fire control officers in the Combat Information Center have been aching for a chance to get into battle. 3.53 a.m., the approaching Japanese fleet closes within 26,000 yards into the range of West Virginia's 16-inch main batteries. The old battleship, which had been sunk during the attack on Pearl Harbor and then raised from the deck, fires a full salvo at Yamashiro, which is leading the enemy formation. The gunman oh! officer tracks the rounds before excitedly reporting a first salvo hit on the enemy battleship. Two minutes later, fellow Pearl Harbor veteran battleships Tennessee, Maryland, Pennsylvania and Sir, California, Perez, along with company, Mississippi, join the fray. Yamashiro is immediately straddled by fire, but is herself entirely blind to the enemy battleships. Within minutes, a salvo from Maryland smashes into the massive pagoda mast, which sets Yamashiro on fire. 
At the same time, the American cruisers have also found the range and are lobbing 8 and 6 inch shells at the Japanese warship. The USS Boise's gunnery officer doesn't even pause to track the fall of his salvos on radar, instead ordering the ship's batteries to engage the enemy with continuous rapid fire. In the same sequence, the cruisers alone will fire over 3,100 shells at the Japanese fleet. The main target continues to be Yamashiro, which is taken in counter. The old battleship is now firing back with its 14-inch The lack of radar guidance is a serious disadvantage for the Despite that, the enemy just the light cruiser USS Denver and hits the destroyer Hammond W. Grant with her secondary battery. At 4.08am, the fleet arrives at the southern end of the Surigao Strait and steams north to join the battle. Yet, the American fleet is simply too powerful. The fourth poison, a loader breaks his hand, loading shells into the gunboat. The fleet is continuing to defile into the gunboat. At this time, Admiral Nishimura radios Admiral Kurita and the Japanese center force. We proceed till totally annihilated. I have definitely accomplished my mission at clear range. Please rest assured. Yamashiro attempts to spring to force in order to unlock the force of the 14-inch gun. I think that this is more of a believer, I think, because a lot of people have said that. A lot of great people have said that to me, actually. And I'm willing to bet to at least some of those 73 million people that tuned in were for the first time hearing Donald Trump for who he actually is. Not the school people man the media so desperately tries to portray him as, which is in stark contrast to how the same publication portrays Harris. And what's even more of it, as in that same issue of time, Harris apparently declined to be interviewed by them, and yet they still went to their knees to publish a fluff piece for her. They're like the news publication version of a sim subscribing to an oldie fans, except in this scenario, she actually does screw them, albeit in a different way. But then Trump went into how Kamala stole his no tax on tips policy. Kamala was the what is now she's denying everything that I do. <laughs> He's saying she was strong and funny. Writing in bold text, oh Trump, no tax on tips. But somehow now, Kamala's saying the same thing. And eliminate taxes on tips for service and hospitality workers. Despite being the deciding vote on the bill hiring all those IRS agents. The A's are 50, the nays are 50. The Senate being equally divided, the Vice President votes in the affirmative, and the bill, as amended, is passed. The press secretary about it. Too. The vice president has said she will. Sir, leave me my share.
my brothers. I will defend the Oracle. Its truth must not be silent. Look at me! Point! Fair trade. I was so happy to finally get a diagnosis. Since then, I have been getting treated, but I have not gotten any better at all. 
I am a single working mother, and between visits to my LLMD and the formulas I buy from her and paying for things for my child, I am struggling to stay afloat. You always I do not have health insurance, places. and it's getting to the point where I am looking into food stamps. My LLMD tells me that I will get worse if I stop the treatments now, because the bacteria are smart. There are no other LLMDs in my area, so I can't go for a second opinion, and it's useless to go to a traditional doctor where I'll just be laughed at. I feel like I've tried everything, and nothing has worked. I attempted to take my own life when I was 15, and now I feel the same thoughts creeping back up as the Lyme slowly takes everything I have. I have even begun to see signs of congenital Lyme in my five-year-old daughter. The hostility, the impulsiveness, the inability to concentrate. I simply can't afford to get her treated for Lyme. I've even asked myself if I should give her up for adoption and if I'm fit to be a mother with my mind the way it is. I just don't know what to do. Lyme disease has ruined my life. It ended my first marriage and estranged me from my ex. I guess my main question is, where do I go from here? What do I do if I'm just not getting better? How can I pay for treatment without going broke and having to apply for food stamps or ending my own life? Other users commented on her post, trying to support her in the best ways possible in the hope that she does not see taking her own life as her only option. What exactly is she treating you with? If you haven't been through a course of antibiotics yet, you should jump on that. I would also seek medical advice from a regular doctor for tests and your daughter to at least get blood tests for your daughter to see if she has active Lyme. If so, she needs antibiotics before any other solution people have found. Again, same with you. Other than that, I think leading a healthy lifestyle, food. Yo, come back.